Hilltop Productions presents a dramatic reading of Robot Wars by Sigmund Brewer. Book One, Death Trap. Read to you by Nathan Hill. Journal One, Chapter One. Sandstorm. Across the plains, the black shell of the gigantic dome gleamed in late afternoon sunshine. It was beautiful against the red soil, laden with iron oxides, and the faded rose-colored Martian sky. From the bottom of the mountain where I stood, it took less than an hour's trek across the plains to reach it, in good weather. But we would not get that hour. Sand rattled hard against my titanium casing, warning me of just how little time remained, much less than we needed. I turned my head to the left, into the wind that raked the sand across me. A huge dark wall lifted from the north of the plains, a blanket of doom that covered more and more of the sky. Winds of near hurricane force lifted tons of red sand particles. Already the front edge of the storm reached out to us. In less than half an hour, those tons of red sand would begin to cover me and the three scientists I had been sent out of the dome to find. Home base, I called to my radio. This is Rescue Force One, please make contact. Home base, this is Rescue Force One, please make contact. There was no answer. Just like there had been no answer the other hundred times I'd tried in the last half of an hour. A solar flare must have knocked out the satellite beam. The sun was about 140 million miles away, so weak and so far from Mars that on winter nights, the temperature here dropped to minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Yet all it took was a storm on the surface of the sun to fire out electromagnetic streams nearing the speed of light, and communication systems through the entire solar system would pay the price. Home base, this is Rescue Force One. Please make contact. One of the scientists walked in front of me, blocking my view of the base. He leaned down and pushed his helmet visor to, into my forward video lens. What are we going to do? He shouted. He did not have to shout. I could hear him clearly. Nor did he have to walk around in front of me. I could have seen him just as easily with my rear video lens. Or one of my side lenses. Forward, I said. We cannot stop. No! We must make shelter! Did he think that I had not thought of this already? Standard procedure in dealing with a sandstorm was to go to high ground, unfold an emergency pop-up blanket, and crawl beneath it. The pop-up blanket made a miniature dome that would easily provide shelter for as many days as it took the storm to pass. But fools who used the pop-up blanket on low ground would be buried by the sand, never to be found again. Forward, I said. Follow me. That's easy for you, he hollered. You're just a stupid machine. He was correct both times. It would be easy for me to travel through a sandstorm, and I was just a machine. But he was also wrong. I was more than a machine, and I was not stupid. I knew plenty. I knew that during each Martian fall and winter, the carbon dioxide gas in the atmosphere froze out of the air and onto the ground, making a giant cut of frost that covered from the pole to the equator. I knew that as spring arrived, the difference in temperatures between the sun-warm soil and the retreating ice made for fierce winds. I knew these strong winds were so monstrous that sometimes sandstorms covered the entire planet. I knew that if we took shelter, we might be trapped for days. I also knew that the last scientist had only ten hours of oxygen left in his tank. If we took shelter, he would die long before the storm ended. One of you will die if we stop, I said. If we continue, all of you will survive. We'll get lost in the storm. No one survives a sandstorm. No, I insisted. My navigation system is intact. We will link ourselves by cable and I will maintain direction. All of you need to do is follow. No, he yelled, not through a sandstorm. Listen, I said. If we stop, he has no chance. Should three of us die instead of one? The scientist picked up a rock and tried to smash it against my head. But, since he wore a big atmosphere suit and was very slow, I moved out of the way easily. He picked up another rock and threw it at me. I put up my arms to protect my video lens and the rock clanked off my elbows. The other two scientists watched, doing nothing. They were very tired. I had rescued them from the bottom of a giant sinkhole where they had been stranded for two days. The first scientist picked up another rock to throw. It was a big rock. Even though his suit made him clumsy, he would be able to throw it hard. Mars has very little gravity compared to Earth. A person throwing the rock the size of a grapefruit on Earth could easily throw the rock the size of a basketball on Mars. What was I going to do? If I let the scientists with the rock's forces to stop and put up a shelter, one of them would die. 
But if I grabbed the scientist with the rock in my sharp metal claws, I would most certainly poke a hole in his spacesuit. With an atmosphere of 95% carbon dioxide, he would die within minutes. Either way, it didn't look like I could find a way to make sure all three scientists made it back to the dome alive. I would fail in my task. I could not allow that. Another rock clanked off my leg. No, I said. No! This was getting worse. If I ran off to protect myself, then all three of them might die. But if I stayed to try to protect them, one of those rocks might smash me and disable me, which would mean all of them might die. I couldn't decide what to do. The scientist threw another rock. It hit my shoulder. A huge blast of sand swept over us. For a moment, I could see nothing in any direction from my poor video lens. In the instant that the air cleared again, I saw the scientist with another rock in his fist, but it was too late. Out of the swirling sand he appeared, aiming the rock towards my video lens. The rock smashed down. The rose-colored sky tilted. The red soil zoomed towards me. And then everything went black. Chapter 2 Ouch! I said. I opened my eyes to the square, sterile room of the computer simulation lab. I was under the dome, not outside of it, stuck in a raging sandstorm. That was the good news. The bad news was that although no rocket actually hit my body, my head actually hurt. That's the way it was with virtual reality. It's like a computer game, except you're actually in the game. Instead of watching your players get knocked out, in a small way it happens to you. I pulled the surround sight helmet off my head. My hair was slick with sweat. The concentration it took to move the virtual reality robot controls by flexing my own muscles was hard work. It didn't help that I was also wearing a one-piece jacket and gloves wired with thousands of tiny cables that reacted to every movement I made. I'd been in the computer program for five hours, and that jacket held every scrap of my body heat. Ouch is right, Rawlings said, looking up from his own screen where he sat at a desk across the cramped room from me. My readout shows he cracked three video lenses and shocked your computer drive. Basically, he healed you, a human defeating a robot. Rawling McTiger. One of the two medical doctors under the dome was stocky and in his mid-forties. He had been a quarterback at his university back on Earth when he was younger, and his wide shoulders showed it. His short, dark hair was streaked with gray. He said his hair had turned gray from trying to look after me. I spent so much time with him that there were days where I wished he were my father. I mean, because voice-to-voice -voice calls were far too costly as my real father traveled between Earth and Mars, and because the round trip took so long, all I really had for a father was a photo of some guy in a pilot spacesuit. What were you thinking out there? Rowling asked. Thinking? I didn't have time to think, I responded. I'd spent four hours tracking them down, and suddenly the one goofball decides he doesn't want to be rescued. Besides, who programmed the sandstorm into this rescue operation? Wasn't it bad enough that one guy was running low on oxygen and the satellite communications are down? What was next? A short circuit that left my robot unit with only one arm or one video lens in operation? Tice, tice, tice. Rolling shook a good-natured finger at me. I don't remember anyone ever making it to stage five of that program. You have this gift, this talent, this- You're about to lecture me, aren't you? I said, sighing. You always start your lectures by giving me a compliment. Then you let me have it. <laughs> You've got me figured out. But I have to discuss your mistakes and what you can learn from them. If I don't, how will you be able to control the perfect virtual reality robot? That's another thing, I said. I was hot and thirsty, and I was mad at the scientist who'd knocked me out with a rock. I was grumpy. Why do I need to control the perfect virtual reality robot? Raleigh gave me a strange look. I've been thinking about that a lot lately, I said, pressing forward. I'm not the one who wants me to be perfect. You are. He still said nothing. I wondered if he was mad at me. Don't get me wrong, I responded quickly. It's fun to become part of that program and pretend I'm actually outside the dome. But I want the real thing. I want to get outside. I want to look up and actually see the sky and the sunset, not just have it projected into my surround sight helmet. I want Tice, look down. Even though I knew what was there, I looked down at my wheelchair, at useless, crippled legs, at pants that never got ripped or dirty because I was always sitting, legs motionless in my wheelchair. I know, I know, I said sadly. Sinking into Martian sand would eat these wheels up in less than a minute. But I can't let that stop me. 
He stared at me. You're the one who always tells me this is only a handicap if I let it be a handicap. Dome horns begin to blare in short bursts. I counted four blares. Four blares. That meant... A call for everyone to assemble, Rowling said, reading my mind. The dome director was going to speak to all 200 of us under the dome at the same time. That hadn't happened since it looked like an asteroid might hit Mars, and that had been five years ago. I was afraid of this, Rowling muttered. He took my surround sight helmet off my lap and set it beside the computer on the desk in front of me. This may be your last computer run for a while. What? It means that Techie has confirmed my oxygen readings. Director Steven is going to tell all of us to avoid using electricity on anything except totally necessary activities. At least until we get our problem fixed. Oxygen readings? Problem fixed? This sounded serious. Too serious. Just as serious as the look on Rawlings face. Over the last week, he explained, and during routine checkups, scientists and techies complained to me about being too tired. And I've been tired myself. Now that he mentioned it, my arms didn't feel that strong after pushing my wheelchair across the dome. Most of the time my arms were very strong because I had to use them at my legs if I wanted my wheelchair to go anywhere. But I couldn't find anything wrong with them, Rowling continued. So without telling anyone, I took some oxygen readings. The dome was down 10% in oxygen levels. 10%?! That was three days ago, he said. I didn't want to spread panic, so I kept it to myself and asked the director to get a techie to confirm it. I hoped I was doing the readings wrong. The dome horns began to blast again. Four blares. I guess I wasn't wrong. Worse, today my own reading showed me we are now down 12%. Somehow the oxygen generators are failing little by little. And it looks like the problem is getting worse. Chapter 3 Journal Entry With time running out, Mom wants me, Ty Sanders, to write all that is happening in a journal for people to read on Earth when we are gone. We'll store it on a hard drive here and have it sent by satellite email to the internet systems of Earth schools. That way, kids who have been following the Mars Project will get a chance to know about our last days. She thinks it will mean more to people coming from a kid my age than from any scientist. But I hardly know where to begin. I mean, earlier this afternoon, my biggest worry was whether I could conquer a virtual reality program where I controlled a super robot. <sighs> now, the oxygen level in the colony is dropping so fast that all of us barely have five days to live. I stopped and stared at my computer screen. Writing is not easy for me. I used to think that because I had a hard time with it, it meant I was dumb. Rowling laughed one day when I told him that. He said I was not dumb. He said most people found writing difficult and it just took practice. He said sometimes adults forget that, and they expect their kids to be good writers instantly. Hearing him say that made me feel better, and it made sense. It was unfair when adults looked at a kid's writing and expected that kid to be as good as its adults who have been writing for years and years. So no, I'm not as afraid to put my thoughts onto a computer screen. I began to type again on the keyboard in my lap. First, today's date. 6 20 2039, June 20th, 2039, Earth Calendar. It's a little more than 14 years since the dome was established in 2025. When I think about it, that means some of the scientists and techies in the dome were my age around the year 2000, even though the last millennium seems like ancient history. Of course, kids back then didn't have to deal with water shortage wars and one world's governments and an exploding population that meant we had to find a way to colonize Mars. Things have become so desperate on Earth that nearly 500 billion dollars have already been spent on this project, which seems like a lot until you do the math and realize that it's only about 10 dollars for every person on the planet. Christy Sanders, my mom, used to be Christy Wallace until she married my father, Chase Sanders. They teamed up with nearly 200 men and women specialists from all countries across the world when the first ships left Earth. I was just a baby, so I can't say I remember, but from what I've been told, those first few years of assembling the dome were heroic. Now we live in comfort. I've got a computer that lets me download new e-entertainment from Earth by satellite. And the gardens that were planted when I was a kid make parts of the dome seem like a tropical garden. It isn't a bad place to live. But now it could be a bad place to die. Today, Blaine Steven, the dome director, called everyone together and told us the gigantic solar panels that cover most of the ceiling of the dome are failing to make enough electricity to run the dome and provide all our oxygen. 
He said if we cut back our use of electricity to only what is absolutely needed, we can use the rest of the electricity to make more oxygen. He warned that this alone would not be enough, but the reserve oxygen in the dome spare tanks will get us through the last few days until the supply ship arrives. So no extra electricity can be used on anything. The only reason I'm able to run my computer is because it's running on battery. It means we won't even use electricity for running showers. It's better to be smelly and able to smell the smelliness, Director Stephen said, than to be clean and dead. Everyone agreed. Director Stephen also said that most of the work under the dome would be shut down. He said people should rest and sleep and read ebooks as much as possible because resting bodies use less oxygen. He said if we all of us joined together, we really had a good chance of surviving. Let me say this to anyone on Earth who might read this. If, like me, you have legs that don't work, Mars with its lower gravity pull is probably a better place to be than Earth. That's only a guess, of course, because I haven't really had the chance to compare Mars' gravity to Earth's gravity. In fact, I'm the only person in the entire history of mankind who has never been to Earth. I'm not kidding. You see, I'm the first person born on Mars. Everyone else here came from Earth nearly eight Martian years ago. Fifteen Earth years to you. As part of the first expedition to set up a colony, the trip took eight months, and during the voyage my mother and father fell in love. Mom was a leading plant biologist, Dad is a Spanx pilot, and they were the first couple to be married on Mars, and the last for now. They loved each other so much that they were married by exchanging their vows of a radio phone with a preacher on Earth. When I was born half a Mars year later, which now makes me 14 Earth years old, it made things so complicated on the colony that it was decided that there would be no more marriages and babies until the colony was better established. I stopped again. Because Mom tells me that much of the Mars Project has been explained so often in the media and in schools, I knew I didn't have to go into detail about the colony itself. I guessed everybody on Earth already knew that Phase 1 was to establish the dome. Phase 2, which we were just about to start, was to grow plants outside the dome so much more oxygen could be added to the atmosphere. The long-range plan, which would take over a hundred years, was to make the entire planet a place for humans to live outside the dome. People on Earth desperately needed the room. Already the planet had too many people in it. If Mars could be made into a new colony, then Earth might start shipping people over to live. If not, new wars might begin and millions of people would die from war or starvation or disease. I wondered, though, if people really understood how different it was to live under a dome nearly 50 million miles away from the planet Earth. I turned back to my keyboard. What was complicated about a baby on Mars? Let me put it this way. Because of planetary orbit, spaceships can reach Mars only every three years. Only four ships have arrived since I was born. And for what it costs to send a ship from Earth, cargo space is expensive. Very, very expensive. Diapers, baby bottles, cribs, and carriages are not exactly a priority for interplanetary travel. I did without all that stuff. In fact, my wheelchair isn't even motorized because every extra pound of cargo costs something like $10,000. Just like I did without a modern hospital when I was born. So when my spinal column twisted funny during birth and damaged the nerves to my legs, there was no one to fix them. Which is why I'm in a wheelchair. But it could be worse. On Earth, I would weigh 110 pounds. Here, I'm only 42 pounds, so I don't have to fight gravity nearly as hard as Earth kids. I thought about my father. I felt like I hardly knew him, or he knew me because he didn't stay long between trips to Earth and back. For a long time, I was always angry when I thought about this because, from what I've read, most kids get to grow up with their fathers, and most kids get to grow up using their legs. But I've decided not to waste time caring about him or about what has happened to my legs. I tapped at my keyboard, slowly putting more words together. When my body and arms aren't weak from lack of oxygen, the lower gravity does make it easy to get around in my wheelchair. The other good thing is that I never have to travel far. Not like on Earth, where you can go in one direction for thousands of miles. Here, all 200 of us, mainly scientists and techies, the name we give technicians, live under a sealed dome that might cover four football fields. I know all this about Earth because of the DVD Gigaron books I scan for hours every day. When I'm not being taught by my computer or Rawling McTiger, I spend my time wheeling around the paths beneath the colony dome. I know every scientist and techie by first name. I know every path past every mini-dome. There's small, dark plastic huts where people live in privacy from the others. 
Between the solar panels that crowd the ceiling, I've seen every color of Martian sky through the super clear plastic of the main dome above us. I've spent hours listening to sandstorms rattle over us. I've... I've got to go. Mom's calling me to join her for mealtime. I hit the save button on my keyboard. There would be plenty of time later to report more on our oxygen crisis, millions of miles away from rescue.